Hi, this is Paul Cargan here with Amy Lombardi, a doctoral student in linguistics with an emphasis in rhetoric and composition at the University of California at Davis. And the author of the study, uh, More is More, Explicit Intertextuality in University Writing Placement Exams, um, that she's here to talk with me about today. So thank you, Amy. Hi, thanks for having me. I, I think um, that your, your study is a fine example of something that academics do. And we were, we were just talking about this before we started record, recording, which is we, we study very specific things that have um, much broader implications. So, so in your study, for whoever hasn't read it yet, uh, you are looking at, you have, a, you have a sample of 100 or I guess 99 um, entrance exam, placement exam essays that students coming from high school entering a university have written so that we can see where to place them. And so you've, you've taken that as your corpus and you've analyzed how, like the mechanics of how they're citing sources in these placement essays. Um, like you're counting the verbs they use, like, like how many times do they say say versus believe versus contend, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I'm thinking, and the reason why I want to talk to you about this is that it feels like something bigger is going on. So, so in, your, in your view, what are the bigger implications of this study of that detail? Oh, good question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it is something that is so tiny and it's really just looking at the specific mechanics of how students are, the way you described it is perfect, right? How are they using the other sources and what are, what are the, what are the techniques that they're using to signal to the reader overtly um, the fact that they're bringing in information from other sources. And, um, you know, I've been teaching for a long time, um, starting from, um, you know, way before I went back to school as a doctoral student. And so this is, this is really something I've been thinking about for decades, you know, um, is like, how do you signal that you're borrowing an idea from elsewhere? And what occurred to me is there are so many different ways that you can do it. And it can be a very powerful, effective, um, almost, I, I want to say, conversational style, you know? And I know there's a lot in rhetoric about, like, well, it's all about a, a conversation. These, to me, are the elements of that conversation. If you have the skills to show the reader how you are conversing with others, aside from them as the audience, and you can do that in a way that that's explicit. You know, you're not um, you're not just you know we're always taking ideas from from all over the place. But the more skillful you can be, and the more um, the more explicit you can be about where you're getting different ideas and how you are weaving those different ideas together, how you're synthesizing them the more skillful you really can be as a communicator overall, right? I mean, it seemed, it, I, I landed on it probably 15 years ago or something as, ooh, this is a key thing that I wanna teach because I really started identifying how rich that whole field was of, you know, the ways that, the ways that you do that can really make or break how effective your your writing is or and maybe even it carries over into conversation you know it's like it's a skill it's a communication skill that carries big implications for mm -hmm. how effective you can be in establishing your position in a place of zillions of different voices that was a long answer sorry <laughs> no that's that's great and I, i'm thinking <laughs> how how interesting it would be to have like a a corpus of recorded conversations to see to see how yeah. how people do that in speech. I'm sure somebody's looked into that in in linguistics. I'm really curious now. Yeah, I mean, it would have to be the right kind of conversation where there is yeah. a lot of you know referencing. But yeah. So 
So one of the things that you, one of your categories that you look at in your, your analysis is um, an integral versus non-integral citation. Yeah, yeah. And so the, so for, for folks listening, the integral citations is where you actually say, while you're talking and in the body of the text, where you're getting the thing from. So like, according to Lombardi, and non-integral is where after you say the thing, you kind of acknowledge parenthetically, you know, Lombardi 2020 or 2021. What year? Yes, this year. This year? No, last year, December, it became available. Last year? Okay, nope. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it came out as. And um, so you, you cite um, some studies that have found, other studies of citation that have found that in like the hard sciences that non-interval parenthetical citation is very strongly preferred and in the social sciences and humanities is it's where there's more room for according to and Lombardi argues um so, so it's obviously a disciplinary difference um but it seems that there's it's not just like a style or a different culture that there's an, a, an epistemological difference happening mm -hmm. And I think I'm showing my humanities bias when I prefer the integral citation. Like I want my okay. students to treat their sources as people, as like okay. this idea came from somewhere. It's not this, the source isn't just the disembodied location of information. Mm -hmm. They made it and now I'm going to talk about it with an awareness of how it was made. So I, I guess, uh, what, do, what, do you, what do you think about that? Oh, I think that whole discussion is what I cut because of the reviewers' comments. Oh, That's really? Oh, wow. Oh, oh, there was a whole other paper about, wow, because it was, it was revolutionary to me. I didn't know how strong my humanities bias was, you know, like, because I don't have a literature background or, or even really a rhetoric background. They don't, I, I was a Latin American studies major as an undergrad. I did a master's degree that was very, um, it's in English, but it's a, but it's, um, the focus is on teaching English to speakers of other languages. And it was a, a practitioners, you know, like a very hands on how do you teach, you know, and working with all levels spoken and written from the very beginning level of like, how you teach this grammatical structure and like, you know, really that kind of nuts and bolts master's degree. I thought, you know, and my university has a very strong like writing across the curriculum. You know, I thought I was so interdisciplinary. Mm. I am hardcore humanities biased wow. and now I'm kind of unabashedly so because I'm like no this matters this this is like you know and I I believe in general education as not just preparation for upper division but preparation to to be good communicators in life and to me that's kind of what this is this kind of, if you can do this kind of writing, you can communicate in a way that's going to serve well. You can avoid arguments by doing this, you know? You can create peace, but this is civil discourse is what this is, I think. Um, and to wipe that all out and put everything in parentheses is a huge loss of, you know, of that, you know, and, and I don't blame, you know, science, hard sciences can do that. But, but what was really interesting and what I cut from, you know, what I had pages on of, I don't, maybe I still have that stuff somewhere if I save those old versions of, of everything I cut, because these international the reviewers were definitely not based in the US and I was blathering about stuff that maybe wasn't as relevant for them at their schools where where students go straight into their disciplines there's no first year comp and i was talking first year comp oh my god maybe this is not as interdisciplinary as i thought it was and they're just like duh you know? <laughs> they're like that's the most obvious stupid thing i've ever heard in my life so i cut it ouch but the implication well it's fine i don't care they public but you know what they published okay. they took that as painfully obvious Mm. painfully obvious and stupid why are you saying that you know i don't know where the reviewers were from but it was very clear they they slammed me for being u.s centric so you know and this was a journal of yeah it, this is a very international journal and the reviewers are not based here 
So, um, yeah, all that got cut. Well, I, I, uh, I definitely appreciate <laughs> yeah. U.S. centric biases being challenged. Sorry they were mean about yeah, it. Yeah, and that's okay. And I cut it, but I was like, I know how important this is. You know, it's just not going in this article for this publication, but it's in my head. I learned it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and my my thought about how interdisciplinary I am is like really kind of not so true. But I found that like, oh my God, this is this is just one little tiny thing that illustrates why the humanities matter. Yes. Well, I, I, I think the next question that I want to ask you is, is follows up on a thread of that, which is that um, so some of the citations or some of the earlier studies you cited found, um, especially in certain disciplines, the preference for the, the parenthetical um, citation. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've just confessed our humanities bias for, mm -hmm. for integral, actually overtly saying who we're talking about. Yeah. And, and um, maybe it was because folks in our disciplines were scoring the essays, but mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. found that the highest scoring essays in the, in the sample that you looked at um, did a lot more of this integral, like, let me tell you about the source. Let me, um, then, then, um, then the, the kind of established scholars in certain disciplines. And you, you say, well, I want to read a little bit, a quote from here. Um, well, I, I copied and pasted it, but let me see if I can find it in the actual article. Okay, I'll, I'll read from my notes. Um, <laughs> you, you say that um, a high frequency of both direct quotations and integral attributions using author plus reporting verb in high placing essays, meaning that these students that, that scored the best uh, are, are directly quoting and discussing their sources, stands in contrast to observations by, and then a list of different scholars in, in previous studies, which indicated minimal use of both techniques uh, in expert academic writing. And then here's your, your commentary on that is, um, the aforementioned studies were based on disciplinary writing and not the writing of students yet to enter the university as undergraduates. So essays in the present study were not evaluated as disciplinary writing, but as representative of reading, writing, and thinking skills um, presumed to be valuable in first year university courses. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's technical, but what, I, what, I'm, what I'm thinking of here is the, the really important concept in scholarship on teaching and learning that we don't want to just give students information. We want to help them learn how to do what it is that we do as scholars, mm -hmm. uh, kind of this apprentice approach. Mm -hmm. And what, what I see here is that maybe a very, like a gap in that. Like we mm -hmm. do want to help students do something, but actually we want to help them do something different than what we do as scholars. Is, is that because it's, it's the general ed? Is it because it's an intermediate set of skills? Like, are we, are we trying to teach students something to write and read and think in ways other than how scholars do in the disciplines? Like what? I would say yes. And I, 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 again, like I, to me, I came out of this going, yeah, I mean, this is why I really value general education. It's, it's a thinking, it's a, if you can do this kind of right. And I, one thing I loved about what, what was the, the, I forget the title of the first article or chapter of yours that I read and holy cow, it, I was looking at, you're using these techniques to the max. And I'm like, oh. this is why I love this. This kind of writing is nailing it, you know, and I'm going, hey, man, you're the master of, yeah. <laughs> of, exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I challenge you, look back, look at the length of your quotes and why you're using them. Look at the integral, like if you, like if that paper were analyzed based on my criteria, it would, it, you know, it, it's a, it's a perfect example. And for one thing, it's reader friendly. It's, it's, it, it's, it embodies, you know, when we say, you know, this is a conversation, that whole, you know, parlor thing and conversation. This is the uh, embodiment of that. And I always used to kind of, you know, when I first heard like, you know, yeah, like writing is a conversation, I'm kind of like, really? 
because sometimes it really doesn't sound like that. Now, if you get these techniques, it becomes that. Mm. So, so what we, what we, what we might want to do then as, as teachers is to teach students a kind of general civic intellectual discourse. That's kind of what I think it is. And I know, I know how unpopular that it, you know, it's like, oh, there's no general, I don't know. Like, like, uh, I, I, I can feel that I'm getting in the contentious territory or something, but I feel like this is the kind of like, this is, this is the way of demonstrating in writing that you have a certain kind of ability to, first of all, understand what you read, synthesize it, interweave it, and, and not lose your own voice. I, I love it. I, I value that all of the, those things. That is the good stuff. Okay, now imagine if people did that in their political discourse, if they did that in their lives. Yeah. This stuff matters. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't care if they're going to go on to be chemists or whatever and how they write in those classes. This matters. In and of itself, for itself, not as a preparatory for some other academic thing. I think it matters mm -hmm. outside of academia. I think that, and I think that's what the humanities are for. And I'm thinking this could just be an incredibly rich conversation to have with, with students if they could be ready. And maybe maybe first year students don't yeah. care enough about citations. But to actually say, like, what is happening yeah. when you say according to versus yeah. throwing that in the premises. And better than according to is so-and-so insists or like the, and that's the other part of the paper is like, oh my God, the select, the, the power of those verbs that they select and the more specific and strategic they are, you know, the more you can pack into that verb and not just say so-and-so says, which is completely stupid. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, 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 I mean, I, I it's not Contends, stupid. Argues, it's not stupid. Reveals. It's a way on the path toward expertise, but experts mm. in this kind of writing don't use says very often because they know they can pack a lot of more meaning into that word. Mm. This is, this is really fascinating because, um, oh, I think it's right here. I have it. So I'm reading a book on, on creative writing pedagogy. Oh, okay. That yeah. begins with, like, the very first thing in the book. Yeah. Is it the very first thing? Very early on, um, it, uh, it's Matthew Salasis. Uh, okay. um, um, no, I said his right name wrong. Um, Salasis. And, um, but he, he talks about how um, in contemporary creative writing culture, you do say says instead of anything else. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating. So that would be some kind of disciplinary something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then if you're writing in the sciences, you don't say says at all. You pack it all into your parentheses. You know, I don't have a problem with that. I just think this has some value in its own, in its own. Yeah, well, I, I think I think the the deeper lesson here is that we want to follow disciplinary conventions, not out of habit or conformity, but because we're trying to do what that discipline is trying to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, these these ways, these details do something. They mean something. Yeah, 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 yeah. They do. And also, since I since I brought it in, this is an excellent book, by the way. Okay. Um, okay. The the um, the next thing that I, I want to ask you um, is about your. It's also a disciplinary question, and it's about your very quantitative approach in this yeah. um, in this study. <laughs> and um, the the scholarship that I read primarily and that I write primarily on teaching is is very much qualitative. Yeah. Um, and I, I could, one could have written this essay in a qualitative approach, like here are and some examples. And that was the original version. The original I, version. I, I, I had, re I had a, I had a really, I had a mean reviewer. Okay. And I, thanks to the editor, this got through because he kind of encouraged me. I mean, the, 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 you know, the comments, oh, I'm not, I shouldn't say that in an interview. Um, <laughs> I had a really mean, I had a really harsh editor. I mean, a really harsh reviewer. Reviewer and that number was, two. 
And that was one of the challenges was kind of like, well, can you prove significance? And I'm like, damn right I can, you know? It's like, yeah, I took my one stats class, watch this. And so and, I did it. And you did. And I, I'm I thinking that there's-, there's I did because value. they told me to. I think it was a waste of space because it's so obvious. Uh, but, but I did it because they told me to, and this is my first publication and I was gonna get it in. So I, I was <laughs> kind of hoping that you would- Oh. That you would um, give a, give a defense of quantitative studies. <laughs> the defense is some people want it. Interesting. And if and I live in this world of linguistics, which spans everything from the hardest of sciences and computational, the people that are prepping to work at Google, okay, and like physics, like sound waves and stuff like that. So like total quant to the you know the the creative writing poetry lit people like it spans absolutely everything and I feel like okay you know I know that this publication is this publication is right kind of in that middle sp space and so am I and I had barely the minimal amount of background to be able to run stats and I took the challenge well good for you right <laughs> That's what I think, you know, it's like, you need, you need numbers. Yeah. I, I give you number, I give you numbers. Okay. And I, take, and I take out the discussion about humanities versus <laughs> hard sciences because they took it as obvious and not worth mentioning that, you know, yeah, it's a humanities thing, so what, you know. And human and the and the scorers were coming from a humanities background, and they favored that. I thought that was a big deal because I thought we were trying to be not biased, not disciplinarily biased. But you know, I, I took that discussion out and crunched numbers. Well, I was I was impressed. Um... <laughs> You know, I, I had three, as a doctoral student, I get three free hours with a statistician. Wow. And I used them. And, and I was, you know, I was, I was terrified because I was like, oh my God, I have to, f and I learned how to use SPSS, which is like some stat software thing. Like I kind of figured that out, met with a statistician. Like I was pushing the boundaries of what I could do, but I knew I had something to present and I, I took that challenge and did that. So, you know. You, you press your, <laughs> take the challenge sometimes. Yeah. Well, thank you. So uh, earlier you mentioned um, just briefly something that you and I have talked about outside of this conversation yeah. at greater length, which is that, that this is on the surface about citations, but more deeply mm -hmm. it's about reading. Yep. Um, to tell us, tell us more about that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, this is one of those, um, so these papers are based on um, a placement exam that we don't even use anymore at my university, but, but I think it's a fairly common structure, um, placement exam structure of, you know, presenting students with two different texts that address the same issue and but from two different viewpoints so you you got you're, you're presented with so as the exam taker you're presented with kind of a, a, a virtual conversation right of between two authors that are talking about you know something that's a you know a concern in, the, in society and they're trying they're taking different um positions on it and then you're asked to write some kind of an opinion of your own based on those texts and you're told explicitly to use the texts in your response. So it's not just a writing placement exam, it's a reading writing, it, it's both. It's, it's re and, I, and I found that there's a term for that, it's like read, read to write, or reading to write. And, I'm, and now I'm forgetting the author that uh, does a lot of, did a lot, Flower, Flower, Linda Flower, I want to say, um, did a lot of research on this kind of reading to write. And that there's a ton of, you know, research kind of in that little 
you know, like this kind of writing that is based on source use, you know, that, that, that heavily depends on your interpretation of other things that you have read. And so the, the basis of the whole thing is that if you don't really understand the readings, you really can't do very well on the writing and that's by design. Like it isn't just a writing placement, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's equally reading. And um, this is another thing. And again, I taught for a long time before I went back for my PhD. And this is somewhere that I also, I landed is that reading really is the core of every writing class unless i mean and, and not always i mean you may you may give them some assignments that are not that way um but a lot of what you give them is going to be that way where the reading their ability to really absorb and fully understand the reading is going to be the foundation of their success on the writing as well you know, um, and so, and I forgot your question. <laughs> just <laughs> like, what the <laughs> oh, that just that it's about reading. Yeah, this is this is something that I just keep landing on over and over and over. Is that uh, you can teach a really good writing class that really is focused more on reading, and there are lots of people have landed on that um, as as a you know I when I taught at the community college for um, ten years before I went back to 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 grad school, um, there were some really wonderfully trained um, re reading pedagogy people. There was actually a little department of like reading, you know, Wonderful. it's been absorbed into English now, but also San Francisco State University is where they're going for that, you know, um, that training in, in teaching post-secondary reading. And, and that's where I did my master's degree too. And so I started, and that is that, that was their whole strategy. I'm sure it still is of, you know, based on all of their research and, you know, that, wow, you know, it really is about getting people, helping people develop the strategies for really effective reading. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, it's absolutely that. You can't do this kind of writing if you don't really know what's going on. If you don't, if you haven't really absorbed and comprehended the different viewpoints that you've gotten from the literature that you're drawing from. You know, you can't fake it and just go off and tell your own stories without, you know, and I've seen students try to do that, you know, <laughs> and they may be brilliant in telling their own stories, but that's not a conversation. It's a bad conversation and it's the kind of conversations we often have with each other when we're talking over each other and not listening. <laughs> and don't even get me started about these so-called receptive skills and how they're not emphasized enough in our lives <laughs> and how we need to learn to listen and read and interpret messages more thoughtfully. Well, that, so, that's, that's exactly what I was going to ask you about next. Um, yeah is right you're, you're connecting the dots from yeah. writing to reading or from citing in writing yeah. to reading and yeah. then the next the next dots are from reading to listening and absolutely absolutely so, so tell us get started on that tell us tell us <laughs> you don't even get me started i just told you and you're asking me to get started. <laughs> no, no you're not listening no. <laughs> Matt, I really like you. You are awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, I, you know, and, it, and this is, you know, I've been listening to a lot to like, like Buddhist psychology and like, you know, like, you know, and, and listening. Gosh, you know, and I'm married. <laughs> and I have a kid. And I, you know, man, listening is like, it's gold. You know, I mean, like really knowing, like, like, and, and when I'm saying listening, I'm saying um, listening without an agenda. Like if you can actually, and this is hard and we don't usually do it, but if you actually can develop a skill of like taking somebody else non-judgmentally at like what are they trying to say and dropping your like 
how am I going to jump in? What am I going to say next? Or why the hell are, do they think blah, 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 or, you know, all the lines that we, you know, especially if somebody is going on some direction that doesn't match our own opinions or that annoys us in some way or that any, you know, or gets complicated or gets, or any, anything that we're not just like, yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. We're not, if we're not a hundred percent, like super focused and enthusiastic, then it becomes very difficult to listen. But that is how people get along is by learning. Like if you can, and as much as you can drop the like, the judgment and the, what is my next move, right? The productive, the, the, the jump in and actually drop into a fully receptive space. And people can tell when you do that too, you know, like a kid or, you know, like even you just are like really hearing and asking the questions that help them say more without, you know, it's almost like, like being a therapist, right? Like that they're professional listeners. That's what they are. Right. And so, I mean, if they're good, right. <laughs> you know, they're professional listeners. That's a whole, you know, that's how bad we are at it. We have to hire professionals to do it. You know, it's like, this... oh, well, that's listening. Um, do you want me to transition to reading? I told you not to get me started. <laughs> well, like, I'm wondering then if, if yeah. right, I'm, I'm connecting citations to reading to listening. And yeah. that might, maybe that's too far of a stretch. But do we want to be teaching students how to cite in ways mm -hmm. that prompt them to or that demonstrate that they are listening to their sources? Is that, is that yeah. the ultimate I say, implication? I would, here? Yes. I would say yes. I would say yes. How do we do that? Huh. We we have to teach the kinds of active and what 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 oh, what were critical and contemplative reading. I mean, you have to teach them to like really to annotate and re you know and I mean I'm I'm using right now in my class um where um I'm using the um the beam structure, like, so they're pick, they're, they're, they're picking apart, like how, and so beam is like background, oh, what's the E, exhibit, argument, method. So it's like, it's a whole um, strategy for analyzing how writers are using a, a, their sources, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's, and then there's some really simple thing, like rhetor really simple rhetorical analysis tools that kind of like says and does. Okay, the author's saying this, what are they doing in this paragraph, you know? And so I'll sometimes just switch, switch um, writers into, or have them annotate with, with the doing. Because mm -hmm. they'll go straight for the, you know, what are they saying, but like, why, or what are they doing? And like, you know, and then thinking, looking back at like, okay, who, who is this author? What is the, what, what, what is their, you know, are they a journalist or are they a, a this or a that? And like, what, like trying to kind of think about like, why do they have this, you know, where is this perspective coming from and giving them just listening to, wow, what is this perspective about? You know? So, um, so it seems then that a study like yours of how students are citing can uh, reveal that they're not reading deeply. Mm -hmm. but that to help them we can't just teach them how to cite different we, we just, no we, we, it's so we much have to actually that. do that behind the scenes work with them absolutely absolutely because they can't again like this this kind of writing like the, the students that really nail it it's like you can't get you can't cheat it you can't you can't cheat to get there it's like you have to have all these foundational skills and that's what was amazing to me is like when you break down like, ooh, like intellectually, what are all the things you have to be able to do to get to this point of interweaving all these voices skillfully and being able to really kind of say, oh, how do the, it's the synthesis and the, the explicit synthesis, synthesis and weaving the voices while maintaining your own. And this is what I've come up with over after, you know, however many years I've been teaching, I've been kind of realizing that's the gold standard for me, you know? And, Synthesis and, or, or 
the simple, the, the explicit intertextuality that is only possible through the intellectual process beneath it. That starts with that that listening, that reading, reading as a as a listener, as a you know fully absorbing all these different ways of seeing it as a foundation, and then building up to like, okay, how do these different things relate? And then trying to figure out, well, how do I? And I, it's so much fun teaching this, and when and it, it seems like you get to this point in. So many times I get to this point where I'll have stu a student say something like, well, if I bring in all of that, you know, or if I bring in this, I'm going to sound like I agree with it. And it's like, hmm, but see, that's a big part of being able to bring something in that you don't actually agree with without confusing the reader to think that you are endorsing it and this is and this this my whole dissertation is related to this of like you know like because i've seen so many common errors that i've made myself also of like reading and thinking oh this writer must you know or remembering and thinking oh that writer supports this position and then you look back and you notice that that writer is not endorsing that idea they just brought in some other voice that endorsed that idea and i tagged it to the author uh so it's like you know even in the reading like we're <laughs> there's i just see so many patterns of like how and i think i think it honestly just probably just comes down to like basic cognitive realities of how our brains work it's like things get complicated we oversimplify to try to make it easier and we miss things that are really crucial you know, and if we're not, if we don't learn to slow down and reread and reread again and contemplate and and really think it through carefully, then then the default is we're going to miss a lot. I really, I really like your phrase reading as a listener. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I like it, too. Did I say that? You did. <laughs> Listening to the text. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I just keep, I just, you know, the, yeah, the reading and listening together as a unit of receptive skills that I think are undervalued and need to be emphasized more keeps coming back to me. Um, well, there's, I mean, you, you, you already talked, contrasted that with, you know, reading to respond or listening. Yeah. To reading to respond. Yeah. And respond. That, that is also important um and then there's there's like i think i think reading to see if we agree or not mm -hmm. also important but i think there's a sequence like like i think i'm thinking yeah. of it, i'm thinking of it like okay so if your first stage is just and didn't peter elbow do something like you know believing doubting yeah. or whatever like believe first or, or even or even maybe pre that yeah like, it's like just like, first yeah, like benefit of the doubt first. And just with other humans too, right? Like like this is good relationship, like I think. Like for me, like I'm 50, okay? I'm starting to figure some things out finally. Right? Like I'm starting to figure out how to be less combative and more productive. Um because I'm old and I'm getting I'm getting wiser finally. And part of this wisdom has to do with like benefit of the doubt, believe, listen first listen carefully, suspend the judgment, suspend the urge to respond or to jump in or to, you know, just like pause, just pause, right? Pause and listen. And then you can proceed to like, oh, okay, this seems, and then ask questions, right? <laughs> you know, and then, you know, what do you mean by this? Or, I'm confused on this part. Can you tell me more? And I'm doing this all the time. And I've and I've carried this out of my teach. I, I treat everybody like a student now. Because honestly, it's just, and I treat my students like like my students are adults and I treat them like humans. And now I treat everybody like that. It's just like, tell me more about that. Oh my God, that's a therapist move. But you know what? They are professional listeners. You know, so it's like, tell me more about that. What do you mean by that? You know, and, and with, and honestly, now it's a lot of it is 
people are using the same words. I love the article that you, that you posted about like, well, some people mean this by diversity, you know, and other people mean this and other, but you have to ask the person that you're talking to, what do you mean? How are you defining this? What do you mean by that? You know, so that you're not putting your definition onto what they're saying, you know? And so I'm just, I just, I feel like so many of the conflicts are from like people not, not pausing and trying to figure out what, it, what the other person means. Thank you. The, the last thing that I, that I wanted to ask you about, um, you, just, you just mentioned um, your dissertation. So I, my yeah. understanding is that this, um, this study is, is a piece of that larger project or is related to it? Kind of, and there's another paper that, God, I really want, I hope they're gonna accept it. It's under review right now. That's another stage that was gonna be part of the next, you know, I mean, that paper was, gonna be was gonna solve the world's problems and now it had to <laughs> and it had to be broken into a lot of things and and I don't think my dissertation is gonna solve the world's problems either unfortunately no but um you know you know how this goes I think you know where you you have these grand ideas and it gets broken into little things but yes I I, I did another I wrote another paper, it's about different kinds of argumentation. Um, it's also based on some of those those, um, you know, we have this huge bank of, you know, essays from placement tests. Um, and then my current study is actually not, doesn't have to do with placement tests, but I, um, I have, um, I created two different versions of a text and I manipulated some linguistics cubes, some, some cues, some oh attitude God. markers and things. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a ling I'm in linguistics. I'm not, we don't even have like a red comp program officially. I'm patching things together from different places. So I'm based in linguistics and I, 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 you know, so I, I'm framing it as like, okay, I, uh, here are the, the linguistic cues that I'm, messing with and then it's like this sort of quasi experimental like random assignment to one version or the other and then answer questions about how do they feel about the topic and kind of see how they how manipulating the author's stance might affect how they then perceive the topic like how like how they respond and and then also questions about how do they perceive the author's stance so there were two parts of it. It's like, how do you respond personally? Like what you're free write about, what do you, what's your blah, blah, blah. And I'm reading through all of those for, I'm reading through one version first and then I'm gonna go to the other one and see like, okay, so the people who got this version, what did they think about it, you know? And what, and, and then I interviewed 28 students out of the 50 some that did the written part. And, um, and then I'm just looking at like, okay, you know, these textual cues, which ones do they tend to notice? How, do the, how does it impact them? And when I interviewed them, I was like, okay, so what do you think? Why did the author put this example? How do you know? What do you think? You know, like, just like really like go back and I, and none of this was based on memory. It was all like the text is in front of them. Go back and read this section and then tell me what, what did you notice about, you know, like it's very, teacherly in terms of like, okay, so, you know, was there anything about the wording that gave you that impression or, you know, trying to get them to go back and look the same kinds of things that I, I think can be effective when you're trying to teach active reading. Right. And I was doing this in the interviews and, um, and there's certain kinds of things that they tend to notice certain things that they don't notice, you know, or that, that tend to just kind of poof, you know, but, but then, you know, you'll, you'll, it, it, some of these readers were, really perceptive and really great you know and they they kind of you know there were different levels all kinds of different levels and backgrounds and um so i'm still going through the data but yeah it's about reading and then um how particular kinds of um Yay. signals in the text might impact interpretations that's fascinating i love it yeah, it's messy. <laughs> it also sounds messy. <laughs> but what dissertation isn't? It's terribly messy, you know. <laughs> God. Well, Amy, thank you so much for talking with me. Is there oh, um, anything else we should talk about before we go? 
Um, no, that I can't do you want to say or share? <laughs> no. Um, just thanks for having me. This is really fun. This is a, a really a wonderful opportunity. So I'm really honored. Okay. Well, thank you. And thank you for doing um, uh, this, this work, paying attention yeah. to... Thanks for reading it. Significant <laughs> details. Yeah, lots of details. All right. So long. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.